Welcome to this module. The aim of this module is to provide an overview of the different operational energy efficiency measures that are available to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from ships and improve the energy efficiency in a cost-effective manner. The module also outlines the steps to undergo when initiating an energy management system and plan. Upon completion of this module, you will be able to do the following. Identify the different operational energy efficiency measures. Describe the importance of just-in-time operation. Describe trim optimization and its impact on the vessel's operation. Describe what ballast water optimization is and its impact on the vessel operation. Discuss the relationship between speed and propulsive power. Differentiate between the different types of shipboard operational modes and their importance for the performance of the vessel. Differentiate between energy management system and ship SEEMP. Overview. A number of topics are covered in this module. They are operational energy efficiency measures, just-in-time or JIT operations, weather routing, trim ballast optimization, hull and engine conditions, system planning and reduced demand. Port management is a complex process. There are a number of chains which are normally made up of a variety of links. Often, different parts of the chain are controlled and managed by different players, but some activities are also integrated across links. So ports can have a relatively complex management and decision-making structure. No two ports are physically and economically the same. Therefore, their operations will depend on the port as a physical entity, taking into account the various activities, such as facilitating loading, unloading of vessels, freight handling and storage, and access to land-based transportation. Clearly, these are quite diverse activities which combine to make port services complex. The graph on this slide illustrates the different operational energy efficiency measures that can be utilized to minimize CO2 emissions from ships and also the most cost-effective measures. What is the just-in-time concept? Just-in-time ship operations mean that ships receive information in advance so that they can time the arrival at the berth. This concept is very important for operation management as it will build good and early communications between fleet department, master and charterer and will improve cargo handling operations and avoid delays. Reducing the amount of time that ships spend waiting outside port and at anchor could significantly reduce ship emissions. Just in time can also allow ships to slow down, providing further reduction in the carbon footprint of shipping, as well as saving fuel costs. This slide provides some important definitions. The just in time concept and practices originate from the manufacturing industry where it was used to reduce the inventory levels and associated costs. In the case of shipping, just-in-time normally refers to process improvement to reduce the unnecessary waiting and idle periods of ship operations. In shipping, JIT applies to both en route operation and port operation. Voyage management refers to all ship management activities that lead to an optimal planning and execution of a voyage. Like other management practices, all aspects of planning, execution, monitoring and review of a voyage are included in this concept. Why do we need JIT? Is there a problem with the operation of ships? The answer is to do with the expectation of various stakeholders from ships. Commercial ships movements are influenced by many factors and include the following. The requirement of a cargo owner, mainly charterers, on when and where the cargo should be loaded and discharged or unloaded. The slotting issue in ports in terms of berth availability or cargo space availability. 
Early arrival and competing for early loading and discharge is common industry practice. Regulatory issues that may lead to prevention of entry to certain ports or detention for some periods of time. The lost time is later on normally recovered by overspeeding. Technical failures that lead to loss of ship availability. Lack of business or cargo resulting in short or long term idle times. Virtual arrival. How is this technique going to help? Virtual arrival is a new operational concept that aims to remove barriers to just-in-time operation and reduce port level delays. Virtual arrival concept leads to slower passage speeds and consequently leads to reduction in fuel consumption. How does virtual arrival work? Virtual arrival provides more flexibility within a well-defined agreement between parties on ship movement, in particular, details about the voyage schedule and voyage speed. The way the system works is as follows. Identification of changes in the itinerary. The main part of this process is to identify a delay at the next port of destination. Agreement to a new itinerary. The next step is for parties involved, including the vessel owner, operator and the charter and possibly the port, to agree on the change in itinerary. This will give the new required time of arrival at the destination port. Speed adjustment. As a result of the newly agreed required time of arrival or itinerary, ship speed or the engine RPM is reduced. To achieve JIT operation, the main stakeholders need to be identified in relation to how they impact on the ship's operation. The key important stakeholders are the Charterer, Operation Department. The Charterer is ultimately responsible for decision making on the ship itinerary and overall steaming speed. Orders issued by the Charterer to the ship are normally the basis for a ship's movement. Shipmaster, the master, based on orders received, will operate the ship and will ensure that the designated dates and times are achieved within the terms of the charter party. Port authorities, they would influence the plans drawn by both charter and master through planning of the port operation. The main benefits of just-in-time and virtual arrival is energy saving, which leads to CO2 and cost reduction. Other benefits include reduction of other emissions in proportion to fuel saving, releasing ships for other activities. For example, parties can agree that some of the available time may be used for planned maintenance, crew changes and so forth. Improved planning of in-port activities. Port benefits. These include reduced port congestion, less emissions, reduced noise, and enhanced safety. Why weather routing? Weather routing provides ship safety by helping to avoid extreme sea conditions. Weather routing aims to minimize voids duration and fuel consumption through avoiding headwinds and currents, adjusting vessel speed according to water depth, avoiding ECA areas. Weather routing is mainly effective for long ocean passages where alternative routes exist and for short sea shipping with variable water depth operation. The table on this slide summarizes different options and itemizes potential applications for use of ports, provides estimates for the reduction potential for various pollutants, and provides the basic cost estimations for each option. The table shows that there's a significant potential for alleviating air quality issues from ports, but they are mostly considered as options for CO2 reductions directly. In fact, most of these are... The two tables in the slide show the following. The fuel consumption increase for different water depths and ship speeds. The approximate relationship between increased wind strength direction and increased fuel consumption for each unit of Beaufort. Generally, ship manoeuvres can be divided into routine manoeuvring and manoeuvring in safety critical and emergency situations. Routine manoeuvring in open seas 
covers ship handling under normal conditions, maneuvering in coastal areas at entrances to ports and in harbour basins. Maneuvering is always connected to fuel saving and energy efficiency. The more the maneuvering, the higher the fuel consumption. The considerable degree to which ship performance depends on the trim is because trim causes changes to wave resistance, changes to wet at surface and thus frictional resistance, changes to form resistance due to transom submergence, changes to various propulsion coefficients including resistance coefficients, thrust deduction, wake fraction. Changes to propulsive efficiencies, including relative rotative efficiency and propeller efficiency. Trim impact depends on ship speed and draft. The impact of trim is either measured by a model test or calculated using CFD. The guidance table for trim is normally prepared for shipboard use. As indicated, the impact of trim could be significant. Currently, in the great majority of the industry, even keel operation, zero trim, is the normal practice. Generally, this may represent the optimal trim for ships with high block coefficients and non-pronounced bulbous bow, such as tankers. In ships with a slimmer body and higher speed, the impact of trim on performance can be significant. In the use of trim optimization, the following ship types would be given higher considerations. Container ships, Roro cargo and passenger ships, Roro car carriers. The effective use of the loading computer's capabilities is important for the safe trimming of the vessel. Why is ballast water important? Ballast water is essential to control the trim, list, draft, stability and stresses of the ship. Why are ballast water regulations important? Ballast water activities on board ship are heavily regulated. The regulations mainly relate to the prevention of specifics from their natural habitats to other ports. What are the different types of ballast water operations? Ballast water exchange, loading ballast water, discharging ballast water. Ballast water can have an impact on the energy efficiency of ships in a number of ways. The amount of ballast water. This can change ship displacement and thus wetted surfaces and ship resistance. Generally, the more ballast water or ballast sediments are carried around, the bigger will be ship displacement and more energy consumption is expected. Change in ship trim. Trim optimization through effective use of ballast water could lead to gains in energy efficiency. Ballast exchange process. Energy is used for the exchange of ballast. Therefore, process optimization could lead to reduction of energy use. There are numerous energy efficiency methods that can be used to optimize ballast water on board the vessel. These include carrying less ballast water. This should not contravene any of the regulations and compromise ship safety. Also, this should not cause non-optimal trim. Have more efficient ballast management operations. This means performing ballast exchange or ballasting and deballasting in a way that is more energy efficient. Examples include gravity assisted ballast exchange is preferred to simple pumping in and out processes. Sequential ballast exchange is more energy efficient than the flow through method as less water needs to be displaced. Adjust to the ship's optimum trim by using ballast effectively. Removal of sediments which will lead to a better cargo capacity and energy efficiency. The graph above shows the relationship between ship speed and shaft power. There is a clear correlation as indicated in the graph between ship speed and total resistance. The hull of the vessels in a fleet is coated with an anti-fouling system. In general, the smoother the outer hull, the less resistance there would be, and therefore there'd be an improvement in vessel efficiency. 
The effectiveness of the hull coating system would largely depend on the level of maintenance and cleaning undertaken. There are advanced hull coatings that may be used for this purpose. The application of advanced coatings will be more expensive, but return in terms of savings could be high. Hull fouling takes place over time. The rate of fouling depends on a number of factors. These include ship operation regions, speed and operation profile, and hull coating and hull surfaces. The net result from this is a significant increase in fuel consumption. A strategy to deal with this concern would be the setting up of a proper hull monitoring analysis system and cleaning to support the reduction of fuel consumption. For example, having regular inspection, photographs and roughness measurements would be a prudent way to monitor the impact of cleaning and the condition of the coating. Monitoring of ship and engine performance to achieve the efficiency of ships can be achieved by the following. Recording relevant data and ensuring data quality. Having regular monitoring on factors that influence ship performance, such as fuel consumption, speed loss, and trim optimization can help operators to keep track of the vessel's condition and how they are performing. Performance trends can then be presented over time to compare them with relevant benchmarks. Transit. Ship is sailing in open ocean or unrestricted waters. Typically, the ship is traveling at a sea speed or cruising speed. Propulsion engines are operating at the highest loads. Auxiliary engine loads required by the ship are at their lowest loads. Auxiliary boilers are off. Economizers are on because of high propulsion engine exhaust temperatures. Vessel fuel consumption at its highest level is due to the propulsion system's power requirements and auxiliary fuel consumption is low. Transitioning or maneuvering. The ship is typically operating within confined channels or approaching the harbour. Typically, the ship is transiting at its slower speeds. Propulsion engines are operating at low loads. Auxiliary engine loads are the highest load of any mode, as additional onboard equipment such as thrusters, air scavengers, blowers and generators are online. Auxiliary boilers are on because economies are not functioning due to low propulsion engine loads and the resulting low exhaust temperatures. Vessel fuel consumption. This is very low for propulsion system, highest for the auxiliary engines and low for auxiliary boilers. At berth or anchored. The ship is secured and not moving. Typically, the propulsion engines are off. The auxiliary engine loads can be high if the ship is self-discharging its cargo. Auxiliary boilers are operated to keep propulsion engine and fuel systems warm in case the ship is ordered to leave port on short notice or for crew immunities and other reasons. Vessel fuel consumption is medium to high for auxiliary engines and medium to very high for boilers. It is well known that the efficiency of a diesel engine is a function of its load factor. Load factor is the actual power output of the engine relative to its maximum continuous rating or MCR. It is normally specified as a percentage. An engine that is working at 50% of its maximum load has a load factor equal to 50%. Load management aims to operate engines at a more optimal load. There is ample evidence that shows that load management for auxiliary engines is an effective way of reducing the engine's fuel consumption as well as their maintenance costs. Each ship normally has three or more auxiliary engines, each connected to one electric generator. The engine and generator as a combined system 
are normally referred to as diesel generator. On board ships, two DGs are operated for long periods at less than 50% load factor. The periods for which these conditions are sustained can include all discharge ports, standby periods, tank cleaning periods, movement in restricted water, and ballast exchange periods. This often leads to unnecessary simultaneous usage of multiple engines at low load factors and beyond requirements. This causes the operation of diesel engines at low loads, producing poor piston ring seal, suboptimum turbocharger performance, low specific fuel consumption, elevated thermal stresses, and increased specific lube oil consumption. All of this leads to more maintenance and higher fuel consumption. In order to evaluate the prevailing practices on the use of auxiliary engines, the following steps need to be taken. Step one, establish the load factor of various DGs through the collection and analysis of data. Step two, benchmark to identify if engines are used more than is necessary. Step three, reduce the use of two DGs. Methods to reduce auxiliary loads are proactive demand management, including load reduction and load scheduling through shipboard operations planning. Ship operation involves a variety of activities and tasks. These include loading, unloading, ballasting and deballasting, inner gas generation and top-ups for crude oil and product tankers, bunkering, maneuvering, standby, normal passage operation, waiting and anchorage, freshwater generation, potable water generation. The planning of all of these requires good coordination between deck and engine departments. In order to reduce energy consumption on board, operators need to work towards more conscious and optimal operation of ship machinery and systems. This could be achieved more effectively if planned for each mode of operation. Examples of measures that can be considered include avoiding unnecessary energy use through switching off the machinery when it is not needed stopping all non-essential machinery and equipment use through planning. One, identify these items. Two, define procedures for the execution of tasks. Three, implement the procedure. Four, monitor and control. Avoiding use of excessive parallel operation of machinery. Optimizing HVAC operation on board. Coordinating and enhancing deck and engine department communication on the issues of efficient use of machinery. Measures that can be considered to achieve the reduction of auxiliary boiler use include the effective use of exhaust gas economizer. The requirements for steam need to be examined and planned. The steam system maintenance, boiler maintenance should be done properly. Include a cargo heating plan for ships with cargo heating requirements. A cargo heating plan is best made soon after loading the cargo. The plan would include how, when and what temperature to use. It is also part of best practice for vessels to complete the heating log abstract daily. A review of the heating log abstract will help with better future planning. In order to evaluate the prevailing practices on the use of auxiliary engines, the following steps need to be taken. Step 1. Establish the load factor of various DGs through the collection and analysis of data. Step 2. Benchmark to identify if engines are used more than necessary. Step 3. Reduce the use of two DGs. Methods to reduce auxiliary loads. Proactive demand management, including load reduction and load scheduling through shipboard operations planning. This slide shows in Figure 1 the ISO 5111 energy management cycle. This cycle 
is a voluntary international standard that has been developed by the International Organization for Standardization to provide various organizations with an internationally recognized framework to manage and improve their energy performance. The standard addresses the following. Energy use and consumption evaluation through conducting energy reviews and development of energy policies. Measurement, documentation and reporting of energy use and consumption. Design and procurement practices for energy using equipment, systems and process. Development of an energy management plan and other factors affecting energy performance that can be monitored and influenced by the organization. This slide shows energy management systems in steps through a number of cycles. As indicated in the slide, typical steps could be step naught, initial planning, understand where the ship or company is, analyze the potential for improvement and decide where the ship or company wants to save energy, start to define the target and develop the energy management action plan. Step one, low cost measures. These are normally EEMSs that can be implemented at zero or very low cost. They are the so-called low hanging fruits. In this step, the concentration will be on those EEMSs that include aspects such as improvement in daily operations and maintenance activities. This implementation may require significant effort in cultural change in terms of how things should be done as against how they are currently done. Step two, medium cost measures. When step one targets have been achieved, then EEMSs that would involve some cost expenditure for implementation will need to be introduced. These are measures that could offer good return on investment and typically have payback periods of less than two years. Step three, high cost measures. These are measures that may have significant cost in implementation, for example, technology upgrade or commercial implications, such as slow steaming or itinerary changes. These measures need significantly more analysis, deliberations with stakeholders, for example, with charters, and so on. In reality, the longer term potential for financial return from these measures may be higher compared to other measures but elements of risk are also higher. The graph on the slide shows the associated costs and payback related to the three steps that were mentioned in the previous slide. The later steps will include measures that could be more costly. It may also happen that the return of investment will not necessarily occur in the short term. It is known that chipboard operation involves a variety of activities and tasks. These include loading, unloading, ballasting, and deballasting, inner gas generation, and top ups for crude oil and product tankers, bunkering, maneuvering, standby, normal passage operation, waiting and anchorage, fresh water generation, potable water generation. Planning of the above would require good coordination between deck and engine departments. Thank you. This slide completes the current module.